Hi, it's Dr. Crone. Welcome to our video on authoritarianism. In this video, we're going to explore the second of two broad categories of governments in the world. Last unit, we talked about democracy and democratic governments. Today, we turn to the other category, authoritarian governments. If you remember last week's work, we learned that a democracy can be defined as a government with the presence of certain characteristics, like universal suffrage, free and fair elections, and a variety of other political rights and civil liberties. When we study authoritarian governments, we don't have a list of characteristics like that to refer to. Rather, political scientists define authoritarian governments as those having the absence of democratic characteristics. That may work to categorize a country, but it doesn't help us much in trying to understand what features authoritarian governments have in common. Fortunately, a very famous political scientist named Juan Jose Linz spent his career studying what are called non-democratic regimes. He developed a set of characteristics that he argues are common to most authoritarian governments. Linz's characteristics are as follows. So first, he talks about limited political pluralism. Pluralism is the ability of parties and interest groups to compete in the political um, sphere and to influence the legislature. Um, so limited political pluralism means some kind of constraints on parties, interest groups in the legislature. So basically, um, opposing parties aren't allowed or only certain interest groups are allowed, uh, things like that. The second is legitimacy based on, some, on an appeal to some kind of an emotion, and usually that's fear. Um, so often the regime uh, will be justified. Uh, the, the leader will say, uh, yes, someday down the road we'll have more freedom and democracy, but right now we have to have this kind of uh, government because of whatever our social problems are, usually economic troubles or foreign threats, um, could even be um, internal threats, that kind of thing. Um, the third characteristic is repressed political mobilization. So in order to understand that, you've got to understand what mobilization means. And mobilization is any kind of activity to get to try to motivate citizens to rise up and express themselves and take some kind of political action. So, for example, a, um, a political party might mobilize the citizens that support it to encourage them to get out to vote. Um, or an interest group um, or a mass uh, protest group might try to mobilize citizens to come out and express their displeasure with the government, um, having protests or things like that. All of those are political mobilization. Those are um, allowed in uh, democracies, um, and those kind of activities are repressed in authoritarian governments. So um, there's limits on um, people's ability to express themselves politically. And then finally, uh, one of his most interesting, in my opinion, one of his most interesting characteristics is the idea that the powers of the executive are not clearly defined. They are sort of vague and shifting. Um, it's almost like they uh, the, the executive uh, can take on whatever powers they can say are necessary. Um, and this is a really common thing that we see in countries that are tending towards authoritarian. Um, so a good example of, of that, of number four there, has, um, has happened in Russia over the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, Vladimir Putin um, was elected president in 2000. Uh, and since then, he has expanded his power uh, through a series of changes to the Russian constitution. Um, so Putin was elected president, like I said, and he served two four year terms. And so at the end of that, in 2008, he should have been ineligible for another one, just like in the United States. Um, but instead, what he did was he um, he got one of his underlings, a guy named Dmitry Medvedev, elected as president and then he talked Medvedev into appointing him uh, into appointing Putin as prime minister. Now the prime minister role was supposed to be uh, less powerful and, and more of a rubber stamp but Putin still really had all the power. So here's an idea where the, the role of the prime minister who's more of a second in command in Russia 
um, starts to increase to be the person in command in a very vague way and in a way that you might not notice if you were just looking at the surface. Um, and then during the time that Putin was prime minister, he pushed through a change to the Russian constitution that increased the length of the presidential terms and also allowed him to run for office again. Um, and so then he was reelected president in 2012 um, and actually then was reelected in 2018 to another six year term. So in 2024, uh, we'll see what Putin does, but he's already maneuvering to uh, change the Russian constitution and kind of give more authority to the prime minister thing where we're thinking that his uh, role is going to be to try to get back the prime minister's office, which does not have uh, any kind of term limits. So that's just an example of, of a way that we would see that shifting power, often increasing power of the executive. So now that we understand a little bit about what an authoritarian regime looks like and how to define it, um, let's turn our attention to explaining how authoritarian regimes come to be. So political scientists have determined two different sort of pathways to explain the existence of any particular authoritarian regime. Um, and those two pathways are called authoritarian persistence and democratic breakdown. So let's look at these two ways that an authoritarian regime develops. So the first one, authoritarian persistence, means just what it sounds like. A country that has been authoritarian for a long time remains that way. Um, and so that might happen when one authoritarian regime stays in power for a really long time. So that has happened in China with the persistence of the Communist Party. They've been uh, running an authoritarian regime in China for almost 100 years. Um, some of its leaders, obviously its leaders have come and gone, but the regime has remained. So that's authoritarian persistence. Um, or we might see another kind where there was an existing authoritarian regime and it dies away or is overthrown, but it's replaced by a new authoritarian regime. Um, that might happen through, for example, a coup d'etat when one faction of a party or the military or something throws out an existing leader and takes over as uh, new authoritarian rulers. Um, that happened several times in Brazil. Uh, it also happened in numerous African and Latin American countries, including Nigeria is a good example of that. Of course, Nigeria is now um, trending more towards a democracy, but at the for for many many years after its independence, it, it had authoritarian persistence through a number of uh, different kinds of authoritarian regimes. So the other way that an authoritarian um, regime can develop is democratic breakdown. Um, and that can happen in a few ways as well. So the first of these happens when actually the authoritarian leader comes to power through the democratic process. Um, so for example, someone with authoritarian tendencies gets elected in a democratic process and then once in power dismantles democratic institutions. So this was definitely the case in um, Nazi Germany. Hitler was not elected, but he was appointed uh, prime minister by the president of Nazi Germany, who was um, fairly inactive and um, sort of a hands-off person. And that allowed, uh, that allowed Hitler to uh, control the, the German legislature and to change the constitution and all kinds of things. Um, it also famously happened in, in, in Haiti. Uh, there was a man named Papa Doc Duvalier, President Duvalier. He declared himself president for life and became a dictator. Um, and then later actually he was followed by his son, Baby Doc Duvalier, um, who had done the same thing. So democratic breakdown can happen from within, essentially, when the democratic process leads to authoritarianism. Or um, the, uh, there may be an outside threat to um, democracy where, for example, the military decides that democracy has to go and they overthrow the democratic government or there might be a mass-based revolution that overthrows a democratic government and installs an authoritarian one. So we'll look more at coups and revolution um, in our next uh, unit uh, next week.
So you might ask yourself, like, why would an authoritarian regime develop? Why, especially in a situation of democratic breakdown, what, what conditions are favorable to either author, authoritarian persistence or a democratic breakdown? Um, and this is something that, um, that many, many political scientists have studied. So probably the most important um, favorable condition for authoritarianism is bad economic conditions. So when the economy is struggling, people are frustrated, people are, um, are worried, they are trying, striving to uh, make a living and keep themselves alive. And that makes people very susceptible to authoritarian appeals of, you know, just let this person come in and sweep away all the bad stuff and they'll promise you good um, good things. Uh, certainly Nazi Germany, that was a big reason why Hitler was so popular, was uh, the bad, terrible economic conditions in Germany. Um, weak or fragile states, that should say or, weak or fragile states, um, which we've studied before, and of course that goes along with bad economic conditions, when there's a weak state, they are very vulnerable to elites who can capitalize on the weak institutions and keep themselves in power, um, basically for their own uh, own needs. Um, they can, you know, use the, the economic resources of the state to enrich themselves or something like that. Um, and the weaker the state is, the more likely that that's going to happen. Um, Cultural beliefs that go along with authoritarianism are not trusting the government and high levels of political alienation. It doesn't matter. We can't do anything about this. We're stuck with this situation. Um, and, and in many cases, that may be true. Um, and then low opportunities to organize an opposition. So um, the government will actually um, actively repress opposition. We see that in China, certainly um, in, in the fights over Hong Kong. We see the government repressing opposition, um, jailing opposition parties and opposition leaders. Um, there's also a, uh, a cultural phenomenon of, of mass opinion that happens when um, it looks like the regime is, is well supported by the people who live there because they're not being, they're not expressing their true feelings. And this is what's called preference falsification. Um, and I, the best example I like of that that is not particularly political, but most people know the story of the Wizard of Oz. And um, we see that at the end of the Wizard of Oz when um, the, the people who've been going along with the witch are happy that she's dead, even though they never expressed their uh, dislike of the witch before that. Let's apply what we've learned from this lecture in the discussion board this week. I want you to write about Russia. Be sure that you read the Russia case study called Oligarchy, Democracy, and Authoritarianism in Russia, and then refer to that and think about these two questions. What's the evidence for Russia becoming an authoritarian regime under Putin? So look at what the information that's shared in that case study and match it to some of the things that we've talked about. And then just throw it out there. Why do you think Russia is trending in the direction that it is, which is definitely towards authoritarianism? Have fun with this, and I'm looking forward to uh, being a part of that discussion as well. That's all for this video. Be sure you view the other video in the unit before posting to the discussion board, and have a great week.